Ah, the beauty and tranquility of the holidays, right? Does anybody else like me, do you always try to just just get one more thing in? Just make room in your life for one more thing. Like we can rush around like crazy. We can fit that in, right? And uh, it never works, does it? A snowstorm hits, knocks it all out. It's crazy, right? Life around the holidays. How do you make room for anything else? I wonder what it was like for Mary and Joseph on that first Christmas. So many years ago. Here we have two young lovers, pregnant, not married, got to have a baby, don't know how to tell the family, how do we let them in on all of this? And then Rome and Caesar issues this decree, we're going to have a, a census, everyone's got to return to their own town and register for the census. Really? Really, Caesar? How am I going to fit that in? I got cookies to bake. I got kids to take care of. I got presents to wrap. How am I going to ever fit in one more thing? How am I going to make room? How did they make room? Let's look at that story together. If you want to follow along from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. I'd love to read this story because this baby could come any day now, right? So Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Do you ever feel like there's just too much to do and not enough time to do it? I think that's how Mary and Joseph felt. Check this out. It says, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. I want you to really notice that last phrase, because there was no guest room available for them. Why? Because Bethlehem was bursting at the seams. There were so many people that had come home to register for the census, but this baby's coming. We've got to do something. We've got to make some room. I've got to find a place to have this baby. Now, if you're like me, you picture what happened next going something like this. Mary and Joseph walking everywhere trying to find a hotel. Trying, because there were no hospitals, keep in mind. So they're knocking at the Super 8. They're knocking at the Holiday Inn. They're trying to find a room somewhere. But nobody's going to let them in, right? So I've always pictured them going way out of town somewhere to find a little cave or a stable to have the baby in, right? That's how you picture the story. Well, as I was studying for this, this was really interesting because I've never seen this before. There's a New Testament scholar by the name of R.T. France who suggests that instead of being born way out of town in a stable or in a cave, Mary and Joseph had baby Jesus right there in a little ordinary home right there in Bethlehem. After all, they would have had family in Bethlehem, right? That's what they were coming home for, to register for the census. In fact, I want to show you a little picture of what a typical home would have looked like. See, a typical family would have lived upstairs, but since so many people were home, since so many people had come for the census, what we probably see in the story is that Mary and Joseph headed downstairs where the animals were kept, the valuable animals, to keep them safe, to keep them warm, where there was a manger, and when this little baby was born, he was born right there. Not far away, not separated from everybody, but right there with the family in an ordinary little town in the middle of nowhere. Now you might look at me at this point and go, oh, that's really great, Pastor Dave. Why is this so important to you? Why are you sharing this with us tonight? Why was it important to Luke? Well, here's what I want you to see about the Gospel of Luke. Luke thought it was important because he wanted us to see the extreme contrast between how Jesus was born and where versus how Caesar Augustus was born. That's why he mentions them here in the story. You see, Caesar had declared that there be a census taken. He brought just craziness to everybody's life at that time of year. And Caesar was the political king. I don't know if you knew this or not, but like Rome controlled a big part of the world. 
And in that time, they actually called Caesar the king of kings and, does anybody know? The Lord of lords. That's exactly right. You were supposed to bow down to this king because he had supreme reign over his kingdom. He was large and in charge. And then you've got Jesus, born in the most humble of circumstances, born in a normal family, in an ordinary little home, in a small little village, and Mary wrapped him up and laid him in a feeding trough, wrapped him up in these cloths. Why? Because Luke says there was no guest room available for them. Now, I don't know how many of you are experiencing this right now or have experienced it in the past, but you know, when the family comes home for the holidays and you jam everybody in on air mattresses, how many of you have slept this way at one time, right? It's kind of fun for a few days. How would you like to have a baby right there? Right in the middle of all those air mattresses. Right in the middle of all that chaos. And yet the Bible tells us this is a story of contrasts. Yeah, yeah. Caesar was the king. He was large and in charge. And then you have this other humble baby born in the middle of nowhere who was the actual king of kings, the actual lord of lords. And he comes to us in a normal way, in a regular little town. And yet this child wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger to keep him warm, this child would change the course of human history. This child, this child would make all the difference in people's lives thousands of years later who've come to worship him tonight. This ordinary little child, born in the most ordinary of ways. And I know some people look for God in the extraordinary. They look for God in the big and the grandiose, and he could be found there. But most of the time for me, when I experience God, it's in the normal part of an ordinary day. Sometimes it's in the quiet moments of my day. Sometimes it's in the beauty of nature as I walk around or as I walk through blizzards with my dog, Benson. <laughs> Just never know when you can experience God. He comes to us when we pray, when we read the Bible, when we take time to listen. He comes to us through other people that he puts in our lives. He comes to us through our children sometimes. He speaks to us. He even comes to us in the midst of our crazy, busy schedules. And I'm here to tell you tonight that I believe this God that we've been singing about, this God who is big and large and in charge, he's come to you tonight. That's why you're here. And he comes to us in the form of a tiny little baby. Born a lot like us. <laughs> in a normal way, in a small little town. And I believe this God is still speaking to you tonight. I believe you're here because he wants to speak to you. I believe you're here and I want you to hear this, that this God of the universe loves you so much, that's why he took on flesh to come here. He wanted to share in your humanity. He wanted to face everything that you face and know what it's like to go through that. He came to show you and me what God is really like. That he's not separate from us and big and large and in charge. Yeah, he's all that, but he's also right there with us in a personal and intimate way. And I want you to know this tonight, that God loves you. That's why he came. He came so that you could experience him and we believe here at Heartland that you can experience God when you place your faith in his son, Jesus Christ. I took a class one time in seminary by a scholar named D.A. Carson. And he had this to say about Jesus. You gotta check this out. Do you wanna know what the character of God is like? Study Jesus. Do you wanna know what the holiness of God is like? Study Jesus. Do you wanna know what the wrath of God is like? Study Jesus. Do you wanna know what the forgiveness of God is like? Study Jesus. Do you wanna know what the glory is of God is like, study Jesus all the way to that wretched cross. Study Jesus, because this God who came and took on flesh wants a relationship with you, and he sacrificed himself on a cross to defeat the power of evil, to defeat the power of hell, so that you could know him, so that I could know him personally. And that's a lot to celebrate, and I am grateful for it.
Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you offer us the greatest gift of all. And that's the gift of salvation. The gift of a relationship with you. And God, I don't ever want to take that for granted. And I am so grateful that we could all gather here together to celebrate that gift. To celebrate your life. You coming into this world, this broken world, to redeem it, to fix it, to make it right. And God, I pray that you'd start with my life. Pray that you'd help make me into the person that you've created me to be. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for this opportunity to worship a God who is right here with us in our midst. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.